Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, legendary rock and metal drummer, Mike Tirana. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers, all you folks out in podcast land? Yep, we are back. Episode 152 of the Rich Redmond Show with my cohort, co-producer, sidekick, good pal, Jim McCarthy. Jim, it's been a long time. How you doing, man? It has been a minute, hasn't it? Well, you know, I had to write a book oh this year. I wrote a book this year on how to make it in country music. It wasn't, I didn't even really go after it, but I have a co-author and she said, we got a publishing deal with a real publisher. So that's kind of how I spent my year. And so the podcast is kind of taking a backseat, but people are asking, when are you going to start cranking out episodes? Well, this is it. And we've got a very special person, special guest to uh, launch season three, hailing from Buffalo, New York. He's in a much better environment now. He's living in Sardinia. Where's that? Sardinia, Italy. Our friend, Mike Toronto. What's up, Mike? Yeah. How you doing? Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. Mike, Mike, Mike yeah. is a, a killer prog metal fusion drummer. Um, and he's played with folks like Ingve and Tony. Ingve Malmsteam and Tony McAlpine. Jim, we had Tony McAlpine on the show, man. Put on. Oh, cool. We did. Yeah, cool. he was he was oh, in town playing with uh I well he I don't know if it was Gergo on drums or it was yeah. another Gergo cat. Borlai. Yeah. What a monster. Yeah. Um great drummer. He was in town when we were doing uh, in-person interviews, and then Jim realized, Jim and I realized, oh my God, we can we can go global now with Zoom. It's not quite as right. sexy. We can't smell each other's musk, but you know, we get we're getting the job done here. Sometimes that's better without that. <laughs> the, the, the flavor and the aroma of the tour bus wafting around after three days in the bus. Yeah, man. But well, you have such a storied career. Oh yeah, the Musk. I mean, it's like when yeah. that that year and a half when everything was kind of closed down. You know, seeing yeah. my, my the guys in my band every day for twenty years, and then all of a sudden not doing it for a year and a it's, half. Yeah, it yeah. was strange. It's sure. uh, so definitely there's a renewed energy and gratitude and humility about this this music business thing. But mm -hmm. there's so many things we could talk about. But um, if people are discovering you on the um, the Instagrams, you have mm -hmm. such a great page, man. You got this like a oh. beautiful piece of fine art behind you, and you the, oh. the you know your angles kind of shoot through these beautiful Basio type uh, chinas. It just looks great, man. A lot of thought has gone right. into. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, during the COVID, everything shut down, and I thought, okay, what am I going to do? You know, I'll make some videos. I started doing this, and uh, I've got a friend of mine that's an artist, and this room here is under construction, but there'll be a lot more artwork and green screens and stuff like that. I, I actually think, you know, the Internet is uh, a nice way to reach people, and uh, maybe it's the wave of the future. I don't know if we're going into the metaverse soon. Who knows? Yeah. Are we there right now? Where's Keno? Where's Mr. <laughs> Reeves? Know. Is it the blue pill or the red pill? Can we take both? I don't know. <laughs> um, but you're doing a great job with it, man. And and Thank it's you. and it's I, I, I feel like, you know, when you've had a career like a lot of the recordings that I'm looking at your body of work from the wiki here and you were mm -hmm. recording with Ingve and Tony uh, McAlpine in 1993. Um, yeah. And and I, I know I was pulling up those recordings today playing is just fantastic man just so thoughtful and melodic and powerful and if you go to your instagram page today you're doing less of that kind of stuff and it just seems like you're having fun you're like hey here's a michael jackson song i'm gonna add some twirls and you know it's yeah. just fun so, so you know there's really some yeah. some some choppy stuff on there and then just like a guy that's enjoying playing the drums which i can really appreciate Thanks. You know what? I just tried to make something that's entertaining for the average music listener. Uh, you know, not everybody that listens to music is a drummer. There's a lot of guys playing for drummers, but I, I think you can reach a wider audience if you just play, um, you know, pop music. I like to put kind of my heavy style into the pop music, and uh, I love playing the Michael Jackson stuff. I mean, uh, Jonathan Moffat always shares shares the videos which is very kind of him That's he's a awesome. very cool guy yeah he's great man he's it's very always friendly, with him very kind. flicking back 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's got to hit the symbols behind him. <laughs> yeah, aside from being a very cool person he's uh he's a machine and he's had quite a career as well right look at all the people he's played with so. oh I, but it, yeah. yeah but he's very kind he shares my videos and uh yeah then more people see it so you know sometimes they do stuff from the past i'll play an ingbe song or tony McAlpine song but you know that music was really kind of underground especially when we were doing it i mean i was working with tony McAlpine for 10 years we were driving around in a van yeah we were we were tasting the road my hands were covered with road transmission fluid and yeah i was you know playing instrumental music and then you know we'd finish the show and people come up you guys are really good but you'd be even better if you had a singer yeah yeah you just missed a point right over the head so now you know it is what it is well it seemed like the uh the ingve stuff had a singer or was that ingve singing yeah no no ingve had a singer he's had many singers actually many great singers but um on that record the seventh sign that was 1994 and we did a world tour on that record and uh that was a difficult record to make but a lot of Ingve malmsteen fans say that's one of the best lineups one of the best records i don't know well, no disrespect to the other guys no. with you with you coming from from the 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 uh, buffalo area um wasn't um Alice from there as well. Were they? Were they? Were they out Alice. at that time? Yeah. Oh yeah. Talis used to play my high school. Wow. Yeah, I used to see Billy Sheehan. I remember the first time I saw Billy Sheehan, I was like, "Wow, what is this?" I mean, he had really long hair, had these platform boots, snakeskin boots, and had headphones on, doing playing like hell. And then later on, when I started uh, playing, I had a band called Zillion. And uh, we were kind of a regional metal band, and we used to open up for Talis. We used to play at the Penny Arcade and in Rochester and stuff. It was great. It's crazy. I love hearing these stories. Yeah, Billy has uh, retired, uh, not retired, but he's re he has left the West Coast, and he's, like many people, has moved to Nashville. So with him being in the oh. area... I cool. just the other day recorded with him, but I wasn't in the room with him. It's like, you know, it's, uh, this is this is the way it happens. But uh, I mean, it, it his tone is just fantastic. It's like a I tell people it's like a giant church organ that's being run through like a, a, a distortion pedal. He's an amazing player. And uh, I'll tell you something. I remember one time my band opened up for those guys at this at the place called the Penny Arcade, which is where I don't know if you know who Luke Graham is, Louis Grammatico, the singer of foreigner oh yeah him and his brothers they're from rochester okay so they used to play uh they used to play there too so this is kind of a legendary rock club and i remember we played and i was sitting on the side of the stage and billy sheehan started to do a bass solo and i looked out into the crowd and there was maybe you know it was a tuesday night or something maybe 50 60 people there and he played like there was 10 10 000 people there and i thought to myself this is the way it has to be. This guy is going to go. I and mean, Lou, Lou, Lou is yeah. to me, you know, I'm a big foreigner fan and, and me Chris, too, their current that. drummer lives out in Mount Juliet. Yeah. Why do yeah, you move to Nashville, buddy? No, I would stay in Sardinia. If I made it to Sardinia, I would stay in Sardinia, man. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, and my buddy Michael Sterto that played with Lou Graham and is now playing with mm -hmm. the Guess Who. He lives here, so it's it's a, cool. it's a it's a crazy thing. So 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 when you're starting out in that scene, mm. um, Buffalo, what was the first? You know, I know I'm sure you got interested in the. Dr if you want to take us back, I don't want to be that guy that's like, how did it start for you? <laughs> but I mean, if you want to do that quickly, and then how did you get your first gig that led to working with those Prague guys? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I guess like every drummer, you start. Uh, pop. I wanted to play guitar, actually, right? That's, oh, wow. that's what you that's what you hear when you hear rock music. But I remember sitting in my mom's car. You know, when you sit in the back seat and you look out the window, and the speakers are there. And I and I started to play along to a Rolling Stones song. Hey, you get off of my cloud. I remember nice. that song. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, I was going way back. I was like yeah. six years old or something. And I was like, hey, I can I can play along to this. I can do this. And then my uncle gave me a, a drum set because his son was a drummer. And it was a Radio Slingerland kit. And uh, still had the calfskin heads on it. And oh, wow. I, st I started playing on that. 
one thing led to another. I started playing more and more. And then I remember uh, I started getting into Led Zeppelin, of course, the Beatles, Led Zeppelin. And then I got turned on to Rush. And I actually saw Rush play in a bar. I saw the professor, Neil Peart. Gosh. In a bar, I, really? Yeah. And I, it was the Caress of Steel tour. Because Buffalo, New York is close to Toronto. So the I know a lot of Canadian musicians. Toronto is a, you know, Canada has a lot of great players, actually. But um, so these guys came down with bands like Max Webster, Wireless, Moxie, all these bands from Canada. Um, and I, after I saw Neil Peart, I it just damaged me. I thought I want to be, I want to be a professional drummer. Of course, I couldn't tell anybody because being a professional drummer in 1977, there was no MTV. Right. It's, you know, but that's amazing that you had that vision for yourself because, you know, I was a child of MTV. I was like, Oh my God, Martha yeah. Quinn, JJ Jackson, 24 hours mm -hmm. a day, music videos, the police, yeah. I'm going to do that. But it, oh. I think it just kind of like, it reinforces the fact that we're called to this thing, you know, for sure, for sure. And then I remember in 1981, I saw Terry Bozio play with missing persons and that damaged me. That destroyed me because the drums were set up in the front of the stage. And, and after that, I mean, I think for a year I talked about Terry Bozio. I lost a lot of friends. My friends were into music, but they weren't into drums. I was totally like focused on this. And, uh, and now I can say I actually know Terry Bozio is pretty cool to know I mean, him as a, as a yeah. person. So uh, is it cool? Drummer. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, very cool <laughs> to meet like your to, idols. And now, you know, us. <laughs> yeah. Now I know you guys. <laughs> well, you know, DW was just, I know you're a PDP guy. Um, DW yeah. just celebrated the 50th, you know, the birth of a, yeah. uh, you know, a, a life amazing, changing amazing. instrument that was born in a garage in Santa Monica. And so everybody was converging yeah. and I, I missed it. I couldn't attend, but like everybody was hanging. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine the table talk in the last couple of days. Must've been a good party. I remember going out to DW when they were just in some storage units and I, and I went to get some sprockets for my DW 5,000 pedals and John good took them and he goes, yeah, we're going to let our guy put them on. I go, no, no. Give me the sprockets. I take them home and put them on. He goes, he goes, you mean to tell me you don't trust the guy who made your pedals? I said, no, because my spring tensioning. I was so freaked out. But I mean, uh, he thought I was crazy. But that was the first d double bass pedal was D. -D yes, it's it's the it's the iconic archetypal pedal. I mean, even though I use other pedals, sometimes I always try to dial it in like a DW, that kind of feeling. Do you uh, prefer the the uh, the uh, double bass pedal or two bass drums? Well, I started playing two bass drums, you know, but then when I went to the single single bass drum with a double pedal, you start to get used to that very similar sound. And when I went back to double bass, I was like, G -g 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 -g. I was like, wow, what's going on? Yeah, I didn't I didn't like it. It wasn't consistent. So now I'm strictly playing the double pedal. You save channels on the monitor desk. Yep. You know, they that love you the for that. that it started. Yeah, they do. The monitor guy likes that. Just one fader here. Here's your mix, whatever. But um, yeah, I like <laughs> to play the double pedal, but I like the look of two, two bass drums. And of course, a lot of people write, why do you have the extra bass drum? Your cymbals are too high. You play. I like to have two bass drums and it holds up the other stuff, you know, the other Tom and some looks symmetrical. No, you know, man, you've, you've earned the right to set up the drums, however the heck you want them. And don't you love those online trolls? I, jo Jim and I talk about the trolls all the time. It's like this, <laughs> this is the one I get. Anyone could do that. What yeah, an right, idiot. Right. That's the stupidest, most simple drumming. And then my favorite of all time is I didn't know Sylvester Stallone played the drums. <laughs> yeah. There's, you know what, Robert most of these Nero. comments, yeah, I, I laugh at the comments. I don't answer these people, obviously, but no. I was thinking about this today. And I was thinking, all these guys writing keyboard warriors, you know, writing these negative comments. And as far as I'm concerned, if a guy wakes up in the morning, he can pay his rent, food, his clothes, and everything else that's in his house with the money he makes from hitting the drums, then he's good. That's right. That's these right. Guys can't, these guys can't do that. They're in their mom's basement yeah. you know, writing, writing hatred comments. I mean, it's one thing to 
to, to play drums. It's another thing to live from it and to endure all the Ups highs and, and lows oh, that yeah. the music business, the roller coaster ride of the music industry. You know what I'm talking about. Well, I mean, you're 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 can on I, your I fourth decade. It's amazing. There what I am that? on the water. Ooh. That's Sardinia. This is a very uh, throwback to the Neil Peart drum set shot on oh, the river yeah. from Tom yeah. Sawyer. Yeah. Yeah, but you're of. on a an eight person paddleboard playing yes. the drums. Look at that on the sea. I'm on That's the sea, just, and the waves. <laughs> yeah, I was out there for hours. I loved it. It was quiet. So, is that a recent shot? Please. Is that a recent yeah, shot? That, yeah, it was about. They shot that two oh, years ago because I was shooting a music video as gotcha. well. I, yeah, but oh um, my gosh. So now, now yeah, look you, at, when you're on something that big, you're you're going to be rocked around. Yeah, it rocked around a little bit. I, if you notice, I didn't put the China symbols up because they're really top heavy and the waves, everything was bending. And I said, all right, take this off. I don't want to drown out there. I can swim, though. Nobody nobody can. Uh, you're, you're probably the only drummer in history to get his picture taken on the water playing the drums. Oh, yeah. that's a, there's, I shot a video where I'm playing drums and singing. It's for one of my solo projects. And uh, that video will be out soon. But um it was a lot of fun to do that's, that. We shot that, all over the island. That's awesome. Yeah. It, it inspires me. I feel like I want to do some sort of a, um, a, a a drum solo record. Not just drums, but there'll be, you know, other instruments, but, you know, almost like a Greg Bissonette style record, you know, where he kind of, yeah. there's songs, but then he cuts loose in a section and it's still approachable and the soccer moms can still relate to it, you know. Why not? It's on. It's on the kind of to do list at at some point. But uh, hey, if you're gonna if you're gonna make a music video and you live in Sardinia, yeah, take advantage of the topography. No, but I, I like when drummers do solo records. I mean, I'm a big fan of Cozy Powell. Remember Over the Top, uh, or that cover where he's on the motorcycle over the drum kit. Heck yeah, yeah. So I was into all that. You know the the drummers being kind of personalities. Tommy Aldridge always in a band. Cozy Powell. Definitely into that kind of sideman thing. You know, these guys were like hired guns, but they were always in great bands. And, and you and Tommy the got the uh, somehow have been tapping into the fountain of youth, man. Every time you see Tommy, it doesn't look like he's aged a single day. And yeah, um, a and you're crushing it, man. You've always I mean, you could always tell Thank from you, a distance man. that you're, you know, taking taking care of yourself. Trying to stay in shape. I'm 62. It's awesome, and, man. You uh, look great. God bless you. Thank you so much. I heard on I, I heard on some other podcast that you do 500 push-ups a day. I do. That's I, awesome. I don't train in the gym anymore. Of course, I don't do them all at once. But, I mean, if you see this machine back there, that's where I do my pull-ups. And, and uh, now I'm, I'm, uh, I started something that's really intense because I have this here. It's a, a Marine Corps training for pull-ups. Nice. And I, I started this last week, and after the first session, I had to lay down for two days. I don't wow. think I'd make it wow. in the Marines. These guys are crazy, man. But, it, I mean, you get strong if you do this. And um, the other thing I noticed when I was lifting weights, I was really tight. I don't know if you train in the gym, but, yeah. you know, when your arms get so tight, you're almost like fighting against yourself. But with calisthenics, you're loose. You don't yeah. get tight. You get strong. You're stretching everything out, right? Yeah, you're you're working your core. Yeah. You're working the the chain. Everything is a chain in the body. Also, sometimes I'll just like hang from the bar for like sixty seconds. There you and, go. Uh, this will make a man out of you. It's not easy, man. I see some guys do it longer, and I'm like, oh my god. I'm, I mean, it, the thing well, is, about the, the uh, yeah, it, it's the carnival things that they do when you go to an amusement park yeah. or one of those traveling fairs yeah. where they i think some of the things is that you could you could hang for 120 seconds you get yeah. some and like nobody can do it i know it's why crazy. they can't do it though because the bar rotates it's rotating oh oh yeah. and i saw one guy one guy was gonna win and the guy pulled him off because the guy was a gymnast the gymnast can hang forever man these guys are crazy strong oh my but God. um yeah, but that's what I do. I do calisthenics. And, uh, you know, I'm not, there's guys that, that can do it a lot better. But I found that at my age, the cycling, calisthenics, and then I practice for a couple hours a day and keeps me going. Keeps yeah, me man. Me, yeah, me, the last couple of years, you know, like 
for about a decade on the road, I, I was the first one up on the bus and I would go do some sort of a drum clinic before sound check. And before you know it, the whole day is gone and you haven't really invested in yourself. So the last two years on tour, I made a commitment no matter what get in that workout. So at the, uh, at the venue, I kind of turn it into my little gym and I've got like a Bosu and I've got cool. the weight bench and I pull it out from underneath the, and then I kind of can do hill sprints and like stretch. And it's, it's been real. And then there's all these apps nowadays where you can do yeah. the Navy seal body weight training. And it's made an absolute difference in the quality of my life, my happiness, all yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Because you get the endorphin rush when you're, if you're just sitting all the time, even if you're doing a drum clinic, you know, you're working and the, the exercise is kind of a, a way to meditate and stretch and, and uh, yeah. exert your, your body, tone yourself up and you feel better when you're done. I also do this thing. Uh, it's a four minute workout, like uh, high intensity HIT. It's called Tabata. Have you heard about it? Tabata. I love, I've heard of it. You know, I like the Barry's boot camp model, you know, but it's, uh, it's just crazy. Four minutes of hell. I mean, it's really hard. <laughs> so what is, what so is, what is it? Tabato, Tabato. What is it? Tabata is a Japanese guy. Uh, he's a Japanese sports scientist and he invented these, uh, uh, techniques where you, you train for 20 seconds, rest for 20 seconds and you do burpees, you do squats, you do squat jumps push-ups and uh, it's condensed into four minutes and if you do it every day it'll really oh i want to do the i want to do the four that that sounds a lot better than the hour yeah. insanity workout remember the no, insanity workout yeah no you don't need that i'll show you what it looks like this is the tabata app this is what it looks like oh so it's an app nice yeah it's an app this is what the hold on a second i'll show you here that's that's what it looks like right there. What are they going to charge me for for per month on this, Mike? The first the first thing is free, and then I think to buy it, it was like I don't know five euros or something. It's cheap. It, it's euros. really good. It's What's really the good. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, four minutes. Four minutes. You're done. Jim Tabato, we are got to do this, man. Try it. Because no, no, I, I was getting like ahead of the game. Like I had a twenty five minute workout this morning. I, I just kind of did a uh, circuit thing with. Uh, yeah, what did I do this morning? I did uh, biceps, triceps, back, and lunges, and I just did that four times in circuits. Oh, so cool. Jim, that's killer. I mean, yeah, Jim. Jim did that uh, uh, fit for life. Body for life. He did body for life about yeah. what was it fifteen years ago, twenty years ago? Oh, <laughs> it was maybe about twenty three years ago. Remember Bill Phillips, the the yeah body for yeah. life guy. Yeah. yeah, myoplex guy. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So remember this vegan magazines. Videos. Yeah, I remember back in the day. Uh, this is how I got introduced to you uh, when I would read Modern Drummer, and you actually, I thought, it, looking back on it, it was a genius move, advertising your services and wares in the magazine. That's how I, I came across your name for the first time, really? probably when I was wow. sixteen years old. Yeah. Oh wow. God, yeah. I've been doing this for a long time. What was it like? Lessons years. with Mike? Like 1-800, you know, like something like that? Or what was it, Jim? I can't remember it what was kind a, of a dad that was. Uh oh, Jim's breaking up. It's the 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 pitfalls of zoom but yeah i mean you i mean you've had you've had a, a a robust career for you know four decades and you're not slowing down anytime soon i also heard on this particular podcast that you have kept a hundred drum sets that's true that is incredible so um i always feel guilty because i keep i have a bunch of like mo i'm mostly 90 percent of my career is in nashville but i have a ton of drums in burbank and i at the, when the storage bill comes every month i'm like yeah. ah, but you just got to do it right you know it's worth it don't ever get rid of your drums you know for me like it's like the, the reason i keep them is because when i play a drum set all the experiences the tour the recording my soul is in that wood that's how i see it yes I sold one drum kit and I and I still regret it. Mm. I really do. I'm disgusted with myself that I let it go. So now I keep everything. I've, I've got a bunch of drums here, but I've got storage lockers in uh, Los Angeles and in Germany that are full right to the door. And I want to I want to bring it here. Yeah, I like to be I love to be surrounded by my drums. Well, I guess I really what you like would do is be like rocket cargo or something. They would cargo it all up and drop yeah. the forklift it to the house. Maybe put it on a ship, a slow boat. Yeah. 
I don't know, put it in a container, but yeah, I would like to have that. I've got some really beautiful drum kits. I've got a Sonar Designer Series kit. I've got Tricks on kits. I've got Pearl PV. I've got two PV drum kits. Remember those? I've got so much weird stuff. I love it. Oh, yeah. I just love it. Bobby Rock was was promoting the PV. Yeah, drums. Bobby Rock. Yeah, Bobby was a big, big uh, endorser for the, for the brand. Yeah, and he had the... Uh, Sistine Chapel painted on the drums. I remember that. The I remember that. seeing that clinic tour at uh, Brook Mays Music in Dallas, yeah. Texas, 1994. Wow. It's pretty cool. Incredible. You know, last week, last week I was in Portugal playing a drum festival and Dave Weckl was there. And after we had dinner and even Dave Weckl is collecting drums. He's got a lot of old, uh, he's got an old um, Slingerland and uh some old ludwig stuff and yeah it's nice to have that it's really it is you know i mean we've got it's it's incredible a city the size of nashville you know we have got three super high-end um drum shops it's like oh, wow i, I mean it's it's yeah. it's unbelievable yeah and it's and it's uh it's great to walk in you know grab a cup of coffee and then next thing you know the whole day is gone and then but then you're walking out with a thousand dollar vintage snare drum you're like oh but uh, money well spent. <laughs> unless unless you're married. I don't know. I'm not married. So I spend my I just buy what I want. Right. Well, I um, I <laughs> well, I mean, so what's a typical day for a, uh, you know, an, an unmarried gentleman in beautiful Italy? <laughs> I wake up. I have a strong coffee. Yep. Uh, start playing drums. Do my for workout. As, as long as you want. Yeah, I really. I mean, uh in the past, I always used to try to mix this thing together, but it never really worked out for me because when you have a relationship, there was uh, some dark clouds, maybe one week, two weeks before you go on the road, many dark clouds on the road. And then yes. when you come back, more rain, more rain in the house. And I just got tired of that. It's just like... I I'm here alone with my stuff, with my drums, all my stuff. No, I love it. I I, I remember yeah. pre cell phone touring, and oh, you'd have yeah. a you'd have like a calling card in your fanny pack, and then you'd go into the truck stop and call your woman, and you'd come back with your 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 shoulders all slouched and kind of walking <laughs> with you. Everyone's like, "Oh, trouble at trouble at home." <laughs> <laughs> You're killing me because Back I can reality. tell you. These kids don't really know what a payphone is. Yep. This gray handle with the crazy cord. And I remember I broke some of those. Bang that thing up. Yes. Because it's like all this craziness comes through the phone. It's like I'm on the road, you know, and now this thing, you have this thing. Yeah. It's like you're trackable. It's too much. It, it, now the phone it's is ridiculous. too much. Yeah. Yeah. If I remember. Gonna, I, yeah. If you're in a I, fight. They, I'm so sorry, Mike. They, we haven't, yeah, yeah, we, cool. we haven't perfected cool. the Zoom thing, but, uh, but you know, you know, you spend the whole day like sending like hearts and fun emojis and stuff, like you know, because it's just what you do. But when you're at a truck stop and you don't know when you're gonna do that thing again with the calling card, or you're, or you're in Japan and it's three hundred dollars to call home. Oh yeah. yeah, remember that? You get the phone bill. You know, like use your Sprint card, but then there's an extra charge. Yeah, it's like, yeah. it cost me five hundred dollars to call home to argue yeah. yeah no no and i one time when i was on tour with mckelpine i thought maybe it's a good idea to get a pager right for business oh yeah this thing you clip remember the kids don't know what a pager is you clip this thing on your belt so i the pager buzzes we're driving i go to a pay phone i call back hey man what's going on <laughs> took the pager I threw <laughs> why yeah. am i answering this guy yeah. You know, he thinks I'm home in L.A. or whatever. Oh, yeah. Ridiculous. So the technology in the end will probably kill all of us. Yeah, they're, she's listening. <laughs> Alexa and Siri, they're at lunch right oh, now yeah. just listening. Thanks a lot, ladies. Well, if they're listening to me, their ears are burning <laughs> because I say a lot of crazy shit. I don't care. <laughs> I, I prefer I was, the uh, we, we were at the We were at the Walgreens pickup yesterday getting some prescriptions, and I had said something. And then Siri came on and said, you know, what's that? I didn't hear you. And I was like, F off. And she goes, yeah. I will not respond to that. And I was like, Jesus, what? <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah. No, they, they've done, they've done drills when they record these things. Uh, you know, when they program these things of all the potential things you could say to it. I won't have that in my house. Yeah, no, it's crazy. It's uh, no, it, it really, it really is. 
That's bullshit. I prefer the 70s, man. The 70s were yeah. good. Nobody knew where I was. Yeah. Well, and I remember, I remember one time you would fly once, get into the bus, and stay in the bus for three months. That's right. You would disappear into this fantasy rock and roll world where people brought you water and cookies and uh, yeah. and pizza. And That's now right. it's like, now you finish the gig, go back to the hotel, take a shower, lobby call, 3 a.m., back to the airport, and you're like a zombie at the gate. No, and then you're, like sitting, you're sitting in the plane with, you know, people that are flying for holiday with their families and stuff. And... It's just not rock and roll. I don't know what that is. Yeah, well, I mean, in, in Nashville, we're lucky that we, we still have that bus culture. You know, we're not on it for three months. We're usually on it for three days. Um, so, we, you know, you meet the bus on a Wednesday, and then, you know, you go play a show on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you come back home, you know, you That's teach, nice. you do your Instagram drumming, do your, do your uh, you know, some sessions on Music Row. It's cool because it's Nashville's kind of like in a good location where you can go out on those weekend jumps. Yeah. It's you're you're kind of centrally located in the eastern part of the United States. All yeah. the guys from LA are living. They're either living in Vegas or they live in Nashville, huh? Isn't that crazy? Yeah, there's been a there's been a mass mm -hmm. exodus. Unless they're, you yeah. know, I have friends in LA that that are there, and you know, they it doesn't seem like they're ever going to be able to buy a home. But they're just like, yeah, but mm -hmm. we're here. You know, I'll just keep renting. I've got my career. I can make the bills. And then I have friends that were really smart, and they bought shit in the seventies, eighties, and nineties, and now their house is worth. Yeah, you know, it's all timing. It seems with that city. Yeah, yeah. You know? it's a crazy, it's a crazy place. I think things are spiraling economically out of control. I mean, since I lived there, I I lived, I left in '97, and when I go back for the Nam show, it's like everything's like four times more expensive. It's really crazy. It's really crazy. Yeah, and I, I, I'm je and I'm jealous of your '70s experience because I tell everybody, you know, I was born in '70, yeah. and I, uh, you know, to me, it's my favorite era of music. Was is like, you know. 68 to like 82 is like a golden period, not only for like incredible bands, but awful like one hit wonders and singer songwriters yeah. and the whole Laurel Canyon thing. Um, yeah. But uh, you were a teenager in the 70s, which is I'm very yeah. jealous. Yeah. And the drinking age was 18. Oh, wow. And I turned 18 in the middle of my high school year. So I was able, I was still going to school, but I was still able to drink and go to see bands. And I saw Judas Priest in a bar. I saw the police in a bar. I saw wow. all these bands coming up. Uh, uh, Pat Benatar with Myron Grombacher on drums. Love Myron. Oh, oh my gosh. All, the, all these guys. I saw, I saw Phil Collins with Brand mm. X in a bar in my hometown. In a bar. Yeah. And he was amazing. I mean, a lot of people think Phil Collins is a pop star. He's an amazing drummer. <laughs> yeah, you're first He's an incredible, uh, very underrated. Oh, very yeah. underrated. But the most popular yeah. and recognizable drum fill of all time. You know what I mean? Your mm -hmm. gug gug And it was in a small yeah. room. People think it, it it sounds like it was in yeah. a cavern, but it was just in a, yeah. you know. I think he came up with that because he was recording something for Peter Gabriel. It was they had the gated reverb on and then he used it for his other stuff yeah i didn't know he's on those first two peter gabriel records oh man yeah. beautiful mistake or beautiful luck you know that they're if, like they if you want to read a good book read not dead yet phil collins autobiography because when you finish this book you're going to be tired this man worked this man really had an incredible career i think he he worked so much i think it maybe hurt him a little bit near the end of his life but yeah amazing so much music good stuff yeah. iconic voice and iconic drum sound incredible incredible that's, that's and tough if you to, try, a tough thing to get try to play some genesis there's a lot of odd time in that music man it's crazy it's really oh yeah beautiful. him and chester thompson i saw genesis many times yeah. good stuff yeah there's but the there's, 70s come on there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, stuff that I, I wish I like I wish I had seen Zap before he passed. I wish I there were some things that I I mean that's very cool that you saw all these incredible game changing bands in clubs as they were coming up. Yeah, yeah, that's how it used to be. I mean, you you got a record deal and they'd put you in a van, and uh, the police were in a van on their first tour. Yeah, and uh, I I mean I saw Aerosmith in the in the early days. 1976, ACDC, many times. ACDC used to come to Buffalo all the time with Bon Scott. Yeah. It was amazing. It was amazing. Bon Scott was very funny. 
very funny on stage. A lot of people don't know that, but he was really a kind of a jokester, kind of a prankster. I enjoyed that show. But yeah, all these bands, when they got signed, they'd put them out on the road and they'd tour. Like Kiss, they were doing 300 shows a year. Cheap Trick, Cheap Trick do 300, 300 shows a year for five, six years just out there. Imagine that, how much work that is. You have to respect those guys, man. <laughs> a lot of room. Dude, yeah, whether you've got uh, a, you know the, the travel trots or you've got the flu, you, you got the show must go on. Yeah, I like to go. So that's a thing. I like to be. I like to be on the road. When I was with Ingve, we had a choice. Sometimes we'd have uh, come back from Japan, and we'd be in Seattle. You could fly home, and I said no. Or you can stay in a hotel. I said I'm going to stay in a hotel in, in uh, Seattle. I'd stay there for a week. You know, get over the jet lag. They paid for it, and I didn't go home for about eight months. Wow. I, yeah, I loved it. I mean, the beauty of international touring is not only how it, it with the education it provides and the insights into like humanity, you know, as opposed to there's some people that yeah. just grow up in their small town. They never get out. But also the food. You're Italian, right? Tirana? Yeah. Yeah. My father is Sicilian. My, my mother's from Abruzzo. Wow. So, 100% so Italian. that's incredible. hundred percent. Like, so I'm I'm uh, my folks are from uh, Napoli. So okay. I'm half Italian and half Welsh. Redmond is Welsh. You, you look more Italian than I do. Everybody thinks I'm German. <laughs> you know, I really thought that as well because <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> That's crazy. So, did you get some of the good cooking? Uh, did you do a little cooking? Yeah, I like to cook, and I mean, there's no bad food in Italy. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I actually, I live here for the sun, the food, and the people. The culture is very beautiful. Uh, so, it's a good place to live. I like Europe in general, and. I have to say I'm pretty lucky to have toured Russia a lot too before all this stuff happened uh, right now in the Ukraine. But I have a lot of friends in Russia. I have a lot of friends in Eastern Europe, and you know, grow. I grew up during the Cold War, so I never thought that I'd get behind the Iron Curtain, you know. But they're just like us. The people yeah. are just like us. They like to have fun. I tour a lot in China. Um, I'd go there every month for the summer, uh, like drum clinic tours. Had a lot of fun over there. People are fantastic. But, you know, if you just watch the news and you think, okay, I don't want to go there. But when you go there, it's it's fun. The people are cool. I'd love to get to China. Yeah, there's, they're, they're oh, big yeah. into drum clinics. I mean, Thomas Lang is on, like, billboards there, like almost like yeah. a Tom Cruise type character. I'm doing the same the same run as he does. It's the Nine Beats Drum School. It's Incredible. very Incredible. Yeah, there's 250 schools in China. You can tour there forever. And they do it really good, and um, they really take good care of you. And um, yeah, it's really well done. It's it's really organized, and and um, the people are very kind. I think you would enjoy it. The oh, culture, that's nice. Yeah, the culture is cool. The food is interesting. Um, the architecture. I mean, when you get to Shanghai, man, it's it's like a futuristic city. It's crazy. Yeah. Really crazy. Well, speaking of <laughs> uh, speaking of Thomas, you know, I I uh, yeah. I really there are some. I feel like there's some similarities in your playing. I went back to um, Hudson Music and saw like a DVD that you had done uh -huh. years back, and uh -huh. there was just such an amazing effortless flow between your hands and your feet. Like I've got good hands from the marching band, and then my feet are like. Mm -hmm. The uh, the drumming equivalent to Eric Clapton, the slow hand, you know, it's like <laughs> bush, 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 bush. But I mean, you, I mean, you can express yourself in the most amazing way with your feet, and it's just really, nice. really inspiring, man. I did a lot of practice, you know, but uh, yeah, Thomas, I, I think Thomas is uh, has more, more technique than me. Uh, he can play all the same stuff, heel down, heel up. Uh, yeah. Remember when he was playing those giant step pedals, those sonar giant step, where he, the heel toe? Incredible. I, I mean, yeah. that's a whole different technique. He had to learn that, or I don't know if it came naturally to him, but I remember seeing him playing at the NAMM show on, on this small drum kit with those pedals, and he was playing very quietly, but very fast. And I was like, this guy's a freak. What's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> He's, He's really good. good. Yeah. yeah, great drummer. Great drummer, great guy, great look. <laughs> Great. Look. We had him on what, about two years ago, Rich. Yeah, and uh, he did it. He did the the podcast from behind his drum kit. Uh huh. 
said, you know, you know, you might as well just name these DVDs things you will never be able to do as as hard as you try. You know, volume one, volume two, all that stuff. <laughs> because that's the way I, they're just fun to watch. And I've always yeah. maybe limited myself by watching them going, there's no way I'll be able to pull this. Well, yeah. It takes time to watch practice, that. but you could, you could oh, call yeah. it, you could call it things I'll never be able to play on a record with a producer on a pop band or whatever. <laughs> yeah, so unless Rich, it's you don't your need record. That. Yeah. Yeah. If it's your own record, yeah. but Rich, you know, if you're playing country rock, right. I mean, do, do you really need to play a blast beat at 250 BPM? No. no and, I, and I can respect the blast beats, but I don't like the, uh, I don't like the cookie monster. So I'll never be in one yeah. of those bands. You know what I mean? Um, I understand. Rich, that will get you fired. Volume three. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I love your, I love your twirls. You know, the trolls hate the twirls, but, and oh, you take it, for them. you take it to another level, but here's the deal. Like, I mean, most of my drumming is, is that my twirling is straight out of the Dino Dinelli, Carmine Apice, the fake twirl right up between the first two fingers. And I've incorporated it into my timekeeping and, and audience cool. interaction, you know, 20 rows back. It looks really, really like a, yeah. a, a really, really great thing. But, you know, you incorporate it into your timekeeping and you'd never miss a beat, which is, you know, like it's not good when you miss a beat, you know, no, but it's it's no, killing. I mean, yeah, I mean, I tell people that, I mean, if you're twirling and you're you're playing out of time and you're dropping the sticks, then you need to go back and learn how to play drums and then twirl later. But, <clears throat> you know, the people hate me for that. But what you just said, even this, even the Carmine twirl, you know, the standard, what they call the fake twirl. Yep. If you're playing to an audience, a general audience of music lovers, and you do that, they will look at you and they will be entertained. And that's what it's about. You're in the entertainment business. It's not a drum clinic. Yes. You know? So all these guys hating, yeah, the twirling, just stop it. Some some guy just wrote yesterday, I, I found it very irritating. He wrote, You're a good drummer, but you twirl like a douche. And I'm like, you know, I got a lot of kids that watch me in the morning when they're going to school, they watch these videos. And I was like, I don't really like that kind of language. Uh, yeah. You can use that with me if you want to come to me and talk to me about it. You yeah. know, and then maybe there's going to be a, an answer for you. Exactly. That you might not like. But, you know, when you write that crap and then the kids read it, so I just, I block and I hide the comment. But... You know, if you don't like it, just just scroll on. I see a lot of stuff I don't like. I mean, I've got a lot of friends of mine that play in the Cookie Monster bands, you know, the Blast Beats. Yeah. And I always tell them, God, you're a fantastic drummer, but it's hard for me to listen to the music around your drumming. Yeah. You know, it's not it's not my <laughs> cup of tea. And it's a little bit too much snare drum for me. But, you know, if a guy's blasting or if he's twirling the sticks or whatever, I mean, that's his form of expression. Everyone yeah. has... The, the right to express themselves and you know people some people like it some people don't but why do you have to be so nasty and write these nasty things i don't yeah. like that it's more it's about really them than it is about you though it's the, it's the hatred they have for themselves i mean i yeah. came across your channel on instagram and you know probably went through 25 30 videos just to because you're fun to watch because you look oh, like you're okay. having fun and whenever you watch somebody that looks like they're having fun that's just fun in general, you know, Yeah. whether you're playing bad yeah. or good. I mean, and you play very well, of course, but I mean, you're just a lot of fun to watch, dude, you know? Thank you. Well, yeah, I am having fun. I mean, I, I, ever since I was a kid, eight years old, I used to sit in the basement and smile and play to, you know, put the speaker, put the stereo on and put the speaker behind my, my drums. That's all I ever really wanted to do. I'm sure you you guys feel the same way, right? I mean, yeah. and then of course, if you wake up in the morning and someone pays you, to do that, you're actually getting paid to have fun. So where's where's the hate come in? I mean, I would never right. write something like that about another drummer. Plus, anytime you write Let anything you on on the internet, it's forever. I mean, the people have, I don't know if they yeah. realize that's going to follow them around forever. That's yeah, pretty stupid. I I think also when you put out that negative energy and it gets multiplied, that's going to come back on you somehow. That's just, you're creating a, a karma deficit. I prefer not to do anything like that. Yeah. Right. And, and also it's like, there was a, uh, go on. There was a, the, the getting back to, you know, having fun and wanting to sit down and play every day. Yeah. I, I take it you're, you've got quite the entrepreneurial bent to you as well. And was this something that you knew was going to happen come hell or high water, or was it kind of falling into it by accident? Was there a purpose behind all your, 
you know, the musicality and, and pursuing a musical career? Did you have, was there a plan B or plan C or anything? Well, I did go to school because my parents wanted me to go to college. So I went, I have a degree in electrical engineering, <laughs> but I never, wow. yeah, I'm like the, I would be the worst electrical engineer ever. I can't <laughs> fix a toaster. You know, God, it's horrible. There have been a few things that have changed. Oh, Jesus. And also, I graduated in 1981. And I remember when this thing came out, it scared me because I know what's in there a little bit, you know, because I studied that. But after I got out of school, I was like, man, I don't want to do this. I I want to play drums. I want to be in a van. I want to be in a bar. I want to be backstage. I want to be on stage. I was even a roadie for a while. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed oh, being yeah. a roadie. So yeah i know i i was a light man spotlight i used to set up drums uh keyboards wire everything stack the pa i loved it i just loved the whole thing and you know learning all those skills when i started to go on the road with my own band i was ready i, I understood i know all the jobs of the other guys you know i've been a road manager when i was working with rage i road managed three tours and those were the only tours that actually made money. <laughs> oh, wow. We were losing money. I said, I can't do this. Let me do it. Because when I had my own band, I remember my mom used to be a bookkeeper. And I was about, I don't know, about 18, 19. I had my band. And, you know, we started to work in the clubs. And she goes, okay, this is a ledger book. You write this down, how much you made. You get all the receipts. This what you gas, hotel, all the expenses. And I was into that. I mean... I, I still do it. So I guess you're in the music business. If you don't understand the business that you're in, you're pretty much doomed. So you must know something about numbers, taxes. Um, there's a great book for any of the younger guys that are listening. I mean, I'm a big Kiss fan and I think Gene Simmons, the whole band is brilliant, but I think Gene Simmons is a really forward thinking uh, business minded person. He wrote a book called Me Incorporated. It's an excellent book. Yeah. You can read it in one day. It's a very simple, short book. But he basically lists all the things that you should do if you're a musician or a creative person to get to your target. And um, one of them is he calls it minimizing your financial exposure. And I did this without anyone telling me. So I was reading the book and I was like, I did that. I did that. I did. Okay. I'm, I, I actually was doing these things on my own so i must have some some entrepreneurial or business sense inside of me mm -hmm. and i think that's also what helped me because of course there's a lot of guys out there that play drums better than me but maybe they don't get noticed because you you have to have both sides you, you just can't be a genius uh, virtuoso and not take care of business yeah. otherwise you'll just you'll be in a room alone you know what i mean so you know, Rich, you're out there, you're networking, you're using your personality, you're using your showmanship, you've got the, you've got skill as a musician, you're an entertainer, and all these things come together, which push your career up. So this book is very good. I, I think it's a great book for young people. I wish I read it when I was 18. It didn't exist. None of this wow. exists. No. Me uh, Incorporated. That's, like, that's, that's incorporated. great. Yeah. Excellent book. Excellent book. And he wrote it by talking into his phone. You know, you can use the, the text voice to text that's how yeah. we did i mean gene, gene simmons is a really a clever man i, I respect him very well, i mean much. just the idea that they these guys loved comic books and horror films and 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 rock and roll and they combine the two you know to the highest level of success for decades and then and the merchandise the licensing oh understanding that mm -hmm. wow incredible the merchandising have, have you guys seen what uh, Benante's been doing as well as Scott Ian. They're they're selling yeah. uh, stage played instruments on their websites. Oh, that's pretty. So cool. if you want to buy the snare drum from the previous night that that Charlie used, he uh -huh. could sell it to you. Plus, you get the meet and greet. You get to take a picture of it with them at whatever the show they're coming to. But you know, for the it's like fifteen hundred bucks. Yeah, not it's if not you're horrible a collector. considering what you get. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the baby boomers, they got money. I mean, I've got a friend of mine that, that uh, is my age, and he's got the Neil Peart anniversary kit. That thing costs about $20,000, and it's Ouch. sitting in the middle of his house. The guy's a CEO of Bacardi Rum, you know, the, the, nice. the drink company. Yeah. yeah, the guy's got money. He plays drums, and he, 
he put that in the middle of his house. He he's never played it actually. Oh my god! So he just he just has it in the house. The gold plated hardware. It's beautiful. Oh my god! Just a collector. Wow, that is incredible. And at the uh, the Nashville Drum Show. Did you see that at the Nashville Drum Show? Yeah. The, uh, yeah. I, I, I thought when I saw it, it was actually his kit, but it was a replica. But I'm going, uh -huh. if this is a rep, you know, if this is his kit, my gosh, he sits, he sits yeah. high in the saddle, a lot yeah. higher than I realized, but it wasn't really Neil, his kit. So no. well, Neil Pert is also a very, he was a very tall man. Yeah. I think he was six. That, feet that tall. he was. Yeah. Big yeah. guy. Yeah. Was yeah. A big man. Yeah. Most drummers are, are, are low to the earth. You know, it's. Uh, yeah. It's, <laughs> I'm kind of a troll. My nickname is the troll when I was in the gym. Where's the troll? Bring the midget. And I'd come out. <laughs> Bring the gimp. Um, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, looking back at all these years, um, yeah. you know, prog rock, um, you know, odd time stuff, uh, groove stuff, your own band, working for guitar virtuosos what's the common what are the takeaways so if you you meet a young person that wants to do the thing what are a couple of things you could say don't do this do this oh god yeah you know what's really sad rich so much has changed yeah that i i really wouldn't know what to tell somebody who's young i mean it would be like make videos and put them on the internet you know go and play live on twitch i guess yeah but when I was a kid, I mean, I was making a living playing five nights a week in a bar. Right. You can't do that anymore. You can't what do about, it. What about the kids that land a tour? Like, okay, land a tour. They land a tour. It's their first one. I would say, okay, for that situation, I would say stay clean. Don't party too much. Meet everyone you can. Give them your business contact you know rub yep. elbows with people make sure that people like you and remember you in a nice way yes. and uh play good play your ass off play as good as you can actually i have to tell you something my mom who's now 87 she gave me the best advice ever it still cycles in my head i remember one night i was playing in a bar with a cover band and it's like yeah the band made me do a solo and there was two people there in the bar and she said Always do your best, Mike. You never know who's watching. Oh, God, that's great advice. <laughs> and she doesn't know anything about the music business. But I'll tell you what. Some nights when there's 10 or 15 people, one guy was watching and that guy called me for something, a recording or whatever. So it's a stepping stone. One thing leads to another. So if you're on a tour and you're in a support act or whatever, meet everybody. Try to be liked by everybody, but don't be an ass licker, you know, just be a, be yourself. But, um, you can always see the cool. ass licker coming from a mile away. <laughs> In Germany, it's called an ash creaker, an ass crawler. <laughs> you must great name for a man. Yeah, yeah. Du musst nicht ein ash creaker sein. You must not be an ass crawler. In German. I love that. So you speak German really well and you speak uh, really. Italian pretty uh, good to, yeah. Yeah, uh, my, my Italian is not so not so good. I think Italian is a very hard language, but it's a beautiful language. But um, it is. Yeah, getting getting back to a guy who's on a tour. Oh, yeah, also, yeah. you know, if, if you get over to Europe, uh, you know, try to spread yourself, spread your contacts, and uh, of course, try to enjoy the ride. Yeah, because. I remember the first tour I did on a real tour bus. It was in 1984. It was a band from Toronto, Canada called Hanover Fist. And we were on tour for three months. We were the support act for Saxon. The first bus we had was a piece of shit. But for me, it wasn't a car. It wasn't a van. It was a tour bus. Okay. Yeah. And then like a week into the tour, they brought uh, a Silver Eagle with the, uh, with the mural the painting on the side on the side yeah yeah and i had the key on my backstage pass i had the key and i used to like going to the bus and yeah i'm on this bus back then you know in the, in the 80s uh it was not like uh it, it was a big deal to be on a bus and i and i remember when the tour ended and I had to get off of that bus. I was actually crying because I didn't know when I'd get back on the bus. I mean, nobody saw me crying, but I was really sad. I was really like, God, when am I going to get back on that 
because it's not easy to get on tour, you know. It's 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 really easy to be spoiled once you've experienced that bus thing because you're like, okay, here are our condo bunks and here's the microwave and yeah. a full pantry and and we got Wi-Fi, you know, the, yeah. you know, five hundred channels. It's it's pretty incredible. Like yeah. going back to a, a van would be pretty tough. If sure, but also, I mean, we didn't have Wi-Fi and stuff on the bus, but I just liked sleeping on the bus. Yeah. I like I like it. Yeah, me too. I love it. I like sleeping in an airplane too. I can sleep anywhere. I've slept on my drums. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a story. When I was with Tony McAlpine, I used to I had my hardware case in the back of the van. And there were two seats and then the hardware case. And there was three guys in the band. So I put Tony and the bass player in the Motel Six. Ouch. Ouch. That orange, that orange and white shithole. That place really sucks. We'll leave <laughs> the light on for you. Yeah. And I slept in the van on my on my low profile hardware case. I still have this hardware case. I had an air mattress and I'd sleep in the van so nobody would steal the equipment, especially if we were in Detroit or New York, you know. Oh my God. Are you hearing that, guys? That's yeah. commitment. That sleeping on your hardware. I've done it. I it sounds familiar, but that's awesome. You I slept. I've slept behind my drums. I've slept on my drums. I don't give a shit. But you know, when you want to play drums, that's what you do. I love it so much. I, I would really, I would really go through hell or high water to do it. I think, and that's why you still see guys like Kenny Arnoff, yourself, or Terry Bazio, whoever. These guys are still doing it, man. Yeah. Steve Gadd. Even even though they travel now, probably better. It's still you get. Yeah. For sure, you get tired. You get tired. No, no, this you is know, you know we're 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 lifers, man. We're 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 lifers. What do you do for supplementation? Do you have any like uh like secret vitamins you're taking or anything? No, actually, I'll tell you a funny story. My father's a pharmacist, so okay, so you're gonna blow we, the the roof off of the pharmaceutical industry and <laughs> go. I'm gonna destroy. <laughs> My father's like, you know, we never had vitamins in the house, and my and um. You ever notice when you take a vitamin and then you go to the bathroom, e. your your urine is green, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know why? You're pissing all of it out. Yeah, because your body don't need it. If you but eat I, like a salad and some well balanced meal, it's it. You get the vitamins. It's yeah, a yeah. Fallacy. Interesting. They want to sell you? Yeah, it's true. This well, guy studied the stuff. He's smarter than me with that. Interesting. And then so so you're. Did you do you still have your parents or do you have both of them? Yeah, still? they're both alive. And where are they? Are they in Buffalo? They're in Boston. Boston. Nice. Yeah, they yeah, it's, yeah they left Boston. Uh, they left Buffalo and moved to Boston. But, uh, you know, um, I'm a vegetarian. I was I used to like to eat meat. But when I was on tour, I ate some really strange mystery meat and got really heavy food poisoning. Have you had it on tour? Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, and the show the show must go on. You gotta just clog it up with a modium AD, and they say don't take oh. more than four, but then you're taking eight. Mm -hmm. And you have the bucket. Oh yeah, I'll tell you a funny story with Tony McAlpine. One time we, he got food poisoning quite a few times on tour as well. But I got it one time. I ate something that had mayonnaise, something with mayonnaise, and I was my stomach was churning, and I was. I was white as a ghost and I was sweating <clears throat> and we were in an RV and every time the RV would hit a bump, I'd be like, oh, we're on the way to the gig, right? I said, hey, I don't feel good. And everybody just looked at me like, we're not canceling. You're going to you're going to play, right? And I'm like, yeah, yeah I'm going to play. I'm going to play. You know, all the, it's all the oh, music. Oh, my is God. <laughs> So it's like, imagine you want to throw up and it's like, all right, let's go run for five kilometers or whatever, 10 miles. whatever. So, oh, my God. We get to the venue <clears throat> and there's a line of people waiting in to get into the venue and we're parked in front of the venue and there's a line there and the door opens and this girl comes on that knows Tony McAlpine and she's like, oh, hi, Tony. And she sits down next to me on the couch like this. And I went, oh. <laughs> this triggered <laughs> and I opened the door and I, I went out and in front of all the people, I, Hello, everybody. I'm Mike Toronto. I'll be playing later tonight. I'll be your drummer tonight. Sorry. It's but yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but I've had food poisoning so many times. I said, okay, I stopped with the meat. I ate some vegetables, uh, some pasta, whatever, but no, nothing crazy. Power bars on yeah. the road. 
I try to keep it simple. Nothing crazy like, hey, let's have some octopus or whatever. No. Yeah, no no, no heavy creams no. or things on the road to keep it super. No, no, yeah. no. One time, one time I was on the road with Taria Turunen, the ex-singer of Nightwish, and we played a place and we, we ate something that had alfalfa sprouts. Everybody was damaged. A couple of people from the band went to the emergency room. They oh were dehydrated. God. It was crazy. It was really crazy. And this was something that was happening in Germany, in the in the central part of Germany. A lot of people got sick from these uh, tainted alfalfa sprouts. They were in these rolls, you know, like those uh, some kind of roll roll up. What do you call those? Things? Yeah, like a, like a like a a wrap, a chicken a wrap. wrap or whatever. It had sprouts in it. Like, oh, this is healthy. A couple hours later, I'm like, I don't feel very good. No. I mean, yeah. I remember I got, I was so sick that night. I played the show. My drum tech, who was a biker, he picked me up and carried me to the bus. I couldn't walk. I was damaged. I was out. And I, they threw me in my bunk and I woke up the next morning in Denmark and I was still like, eh, but we had a day off. <laughs> I said, no more sprouts, no more strange food. That's right. And yeah, in Italy, yeah. just a just a maid. Do you have like a, a nice corner cafe or something that you're a regular at where they walk in like Mike and you got a nice yeah. seat ready for you? There's there's some places here where you can go kind of like, you know, family run. They make uh, they make the pasta by hand, gnocchi by hand. Uh, orecchetta, you know, orecchetta, the, the, yeah. the pasta that looks like little ears, orecchi. Oh, yeah, orecchi. yeah, 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 yeah. With oh, pesto, yeah, yeah, homemade yeah. pesto, so good. Good oh, wine. Man. I lived in Tuscany for 12 years, so I lived uh, in, a, in a little city called Forte di Marmi, which was uh, kind of a touristic place for the, the rich and famous in the... The Clooney's kind of, like, of the, the world. world. Yeah, the, yeah, the Riviera of Tuscany. Uh, yeah, Cluny is uh, in Lake Como, mm. Milano, outside of Milano. But yeah, there's a, a Sting, Sting was in Tuscany. There's a lot of wealthy people that settle there. I think some of the guys, what's the name of that band now? Oh, God, I forgot the name of the band. Three-piece band from England. Oh, can't remember now. Sorry. Um, Muse. Some oh, of the Muse. guys from Muse. Muse, they have a studio right. in Tuscany right. in a house there. But um, it's a beautiful place to live. Uh, the countryside is beautiful. The food is really good. And if you like to drink wine, some of the best wine. Incredible. I also, I also work a lot in Spain. I play in a Spanish heavy metal band like a progressive heavy metal band called avalanche and, and i remember when i was studying spanish in high school i took spanish one two times i failed i took spanish two i hated it my mom's like you need to learn spanish and i'm like i don't need to learn spanish i live in america that's how <laughs> that's how stupid i was that is the <laughs> language to learn for sure yeah i mean uh, it's uh next to Ch chinese it's the number one second most spoken language in the world so yeah, when sometimes when you're a kid, you're pretty stupid. I was the same way because I lived in El Paso, Texas, and I was like, I'm not going to learn this. Oh. I'm never going to. Hey, this is, you know, I, I I never really learned it. So you're from El Paso. Well, originally Connecticut, and then I was 11 and moved to El Paso, Texas. Yeah. Right. yeah, you used man. to play a club with Tony McAlpine called Sassos. Sassos Sass in El Paso. Heck yeah, man, Sassos. You know, you know Sassos. What rock, place? Rock club, yeah. Yeah, we used to play the Mason Jar in Phoenix, Arizona. There was a pole in the middle of the stage, and the owner of the of the <laughs> of the Mason Jar was in a a little Italian guy. His name was Franco Gaglioni. Oh my God, that's <laughs> had the, all yeah. the gold chains and the Mister T starter kit, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know what's crazy? The crazy about the music business, you meet a lot of characters. Yeah, I mean, I, you're a character, so are but, you. And you're, yeah, we're total characters. We meet, we meet people that are even more characters than you are, and it's like, whoa, what's going on here? So, hey, Jim, do you um, you got something you're dying to ask Mike, or do you want to ask him the random question of the day? We got a jingle for it. What do you want to do, man? We don't have the jingle, but I do have a random question. Oh, okay. Uh, getting back to the Italian side of things, with the yeah. food and everything, is it true? I mean, can you pretty much eat anything you want there and not gain weight because of the composition of the food and how it's made? yeah i mean i eat a lot of pasta i eat a lot of pizza and it's natural it's not a lot of my friends that live in america that are my age they're very round they're almost bloated and it's from eating this fucking white bread and whatever the hell there's a lot of chemicals in the food <clears throat> but yeah the food here is very natural 
the cheese, you can eat cheese, you can eat pasta, pizza. You're from Naples. I have a, a drum clinic in Naples next week. Wow. When you go to Naples, when you go to Naples and you eat the mozzarella di bufala, when you cut it, it's like cream. Mm. Uh. It's a, it's the pizza in Naples is the best. Yeah, see, like I'm tolerant. Yeah. Like it's I'm an Italian I'm, it's a curse. I'm like massively lactose intolerant. So I keep this oh. pill. I keep that pill lactate, whoever des designs that pill, I keep that laboratory in business. Um, uh, and I have my rules, you know, no dairy on show days, but I'll do dairy like on the day off. But I bet if I went to Italy and I was eating the local cultured milk, it might be a different story because it's not big farming. Maybe. Dairy, you know what I mean? Yeah, you you can. Uh, I mean, I've had some vacations where you stay at a something called an agriturismo, which is say a hotel on a farm, farmland, and everything that you eat and drink is uh, made Sourced. at the farm. Yeah, yeah. The cheese, the the meat, uh, whatever you know, the wine. It's homemade and it's all from the region, and it's very natural. And yeah, you don't have any problems with gaining weight or uh, feeling bad but i of course i don't have the problem this lactose that's a shame to have that because you miss out on a gelato and the i'm i'm cheese. wondering rich if you were to go to europe and live there if your lactose intolerance would go away i think it would i was sort of thinking i was it would probably go away because there's so much happening with the just the way we farm and uh, preserve yeah. things in the united states you know big it's agriculture true. yeah I'll tell you something, after living here in Europe, when I go back to America, when I you, know, you go to Denny's, I like Denny's, you know, yeah. but when you when you order your food, it, it all tastes the same. I can taste the grill like it's, you know, the the pancakes, the eggs, it's all it's all the same flavor. It's very strange. Interesting. But I, I didn't realize that when I was in America, you know. And uh, the Italian people here, they call American coffee because, OK, you go into a restaurant and you can get you go to Denny's, you can get free refills. Right. So and it's it's very thin. It's just black water. And uh, the Italian people here call American coffee. They call it aqua sporca, dirty water. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I like a nice, strong coffee. Have, man. Come to Italy. Have have Starbucks to Italy? out there? No, yeah, there's I, no Starbucks here. Only in the airport. No maybe, maybe you see. No, no Starbucks. I mean, you go to a go to a bar. They call it a bar, right? Where you can buy alcohol too. But the the coffee is fantastic. I mean, it's it's got this body to it, like a chocolatey flavor. I don't know how to describe it, but you just have to you have, just have to drink it. I think yeah. the food the food and the culture in Europe is better. And I, I'm not saying that to well, sure. downgrade my homeland. I mean, I'm from America, of course. I wouldn't play drums the way I do if I wasn't born in America. But um, I enjoy the, the different cultures. I like going to France. I like going to Holland or I've lived in Holland. I've lived in Germany, Denmark. Scandinavia is fantastic. What Have determines these? Well, yeah, uh, you know, not nearly enough. I've been to, I've been to, I think, 18 or 19 countries, which is pretty okay. cool. As far as like Italy, um, I've been to Naples and Pisa and I had one incredible night at Pisa. We were in this beautiful restaurant, like the towers, like right there outside the restaurant. And we had this translator and he kept talking about like pointing to the moon. And he, was, he kept trying to tell me when the sun goes down and the moon comes out, me and you, because he could tell that I was the party guy. Grappa, uh, grappa, oh, oh, grappa. grappa. So we had the grappa and then like a seven course meal. And it was just oh. a life changing night, you know, very yeah, memorable. Like grappa, lemon cello. I oh, mean, yeah. Next time you come back to Italy, you also have to go to Florence because that's really the epicenter of the Renaissance. A lot of good food, good wine there. I mean, Italy is, uh, has a beautiful food culture, historical culture. I, I like that. I like being around that. You know, you're sometimes you're in a building that's a thousand years old or whatever. It's pretty cool. You yeah, can man. Feel it. You I'm can jealous. Feel it. I'm jealous that you're around all that. Cool. Oh, what does, okay. what determines your your moves? Like you're in Germany and then you're like, I'm gonna move to Holland. I'm gonna move to Italy. I'm gonna move to Italy. <laughs> is it is it like gigs or relationships end or like what determines the normally, move? <laughs> normally, well, in the past when I was younger, it was because for a woman. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. I don't move. I don't. I don't move like that anymore. I moved here for myself. 
<laughs> nice. Exactly. Yeah, I can tell you, you know, you know how it goes. Yeah. How old are you, Rich? How old I, are you? You and I are just 10 years apart. Okay. So, yeah, as you, as you get older, you start to perceive things differently. It's like, you know, I think I should just go there alone and I'll be fine. <laughs> but not to say anything bad about the, the other girls, but when you start moving for a relationship everywhere, it gets a little crazy. But I was younger. I had the power. Yeah. I enjoyed living in Denmark. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you, could you, could you play with the wooden shoes? Did you ever try it? (laughs) That's Holland. Oh, sorry. See, what an, (laughs) I'm a stupid American. (laughs) No, it's okay. But I I used to live in Holland (laughs) and and my friends were like, okay, so you live in Holland. What, what, uh, what language do they speak? I said, they speak Dutch. Okay, but where's the Netherlands? The Netherlands is Holland. What the hell? They don't understand anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I remember one time I had I had to pick up the drum set. What? Is it cold there typically in Holland? It gets cold, yeah. Netherlands, not not too bad. The weather's kind of mild. It rains. Uh, If you're in the north north of Germany, you get snow. I lived in Hamburg for twelve years. but I remember when I was living in Holland, I had my first premiere endorsement. Nico McBrain actually got me, hooked, opened the door for me and got me my first deal when I was in Europe. God awesome. bless him. Yeah. Talking nice about a man. character. Yeah, he's a character for sure. Yeah, well, he's a great guy, man. He was so cool. And actually, nobody ever helped me like that before. So I'll never forget him for that. And I want to give him credit right now. But um yeah. I remember the drums arrived in the north of Holland in like, I don't know if it was Den Haag at a harbor. And so the guy's like, yeah, your drums are here. You can come and get them. And I'm like, okay. So I got the car. I said, I'll be, I'll be there in a couple hours. He's like, you're going to drive here? Like it's two hours, you know, two hours. You're Holland is the size of Los Angeles. Basically the country of Holland is the size of Los Angeles. So oh my God. These people are like, you're going to drive across the, yes, I'm going to drive across the country right now. And then I'm going to drive back four hours. I'm a hop, skip and a jump for, oh my. for an American guy. But <laughs> right. they, they thought it was very strange that I would drive across the country. That is incredible. Wanted, oh my God. I wanted those drums. I still have them. Yeah. You still got them. So, Hey, are you yeah. doing, you know, you're, you got your online presence, you know, you got your Hudson products that are out there. Um, are you doing any um, online or in-person teaching? Uh, no, but I, I would might start to do something where I make like instructional packages. Yeah. I think sometimes when you do like one-on-one teaching, sometimes I think it's very difficult. I give a lot of credit to somebody who's teaching all the time, especially when you're teaching younger people and they don't practice. Oh, God. And, it just becomes babysitting. And yeah, and they're scared. You know, they're scared. They don't know the lesson. It's like, look, calm down. I know you're scared. I'm not going to tell your parents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I I, I, I do that. It's a a fun little, you know, it's a fun little way to, uh, you know, affect people, you know, get them started on their journey. Yeah, man. It's fun. Do you teach younger younger people? How how is the youngest person? Sure. You know, I I try not to go look below like eight. You know, eight or ten. Yeah, it's pretty young. Well, they a lot of times, you know, the kids like they already know kind of know like they they already know kind of like how to hold the sticks, or maybe they're in the school of rock, but they don't have any technique, or maybe they they just need they they've got a killer groove, but they don't know how to read a lick of music, and so you just kind of address their weakness and get That's going cool. on that. But and then I checked out your the nice. website is I don't know if it's a, is it is it still under construction? Tarana dot com. Yeah, that, that's my website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's uh. It's under construction, yeah, because I want to uh, put up the uh, instructional packages there and stuff yeah. like that. So, but man, there's so many things to do. Actually, the social media thing is like a 24 hour a day job. It's a full time job if you want to yeah. release content every day. Yeah. Which I try to do. Are you batching, like uh, just film like 30 videos and then drip them out or? I wish I could do that because I'm doing other gigs and stuff. Um, yeah. So sometimes I'll. You know, I'll wake up in the morning and say, I want to play this song and I'll track it, you know, and do a couple of takes. But, you know, it takes time to edit it because I edit the song to one minute. So I do a lot of cutting. Yep. And then, then, okay, I start playing it. It's like you'll get to work out some choreography, make, throw some tricks in there for the visuals. And then you have to perform it. Yep. And sometimes I say, I make mistakes and I say bad words. I say oh, a lot of bad no, I never do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm mm. probably going to hell for some of the things I've said. 
<laughs> well, I give you credit for doing TikTok. You know, I, I it's the one oh, yeah. I haven't ventured into the waters yet. You know. Oh, TikTok is a strange animal. Uh, everyone's like, oh, what are you doing on there? You're too old. No, TikTok now is the most popular social media platform. And now it's actually become a source for, for news. Actually, in some cases, it's a source for the truth because you don't really get the truth on the conventional news networks. Yeah. So sometimes some guys in, in the Ukraine with a camera and there's bombs flying around. That's the real deal. He's not yeah. faking it. Dude, you know, that's not a movie production. Look at your, so. your, your TikTok is, uh, you, you, you got four times on TikTok than you do on Instagram, of course. Look yeah, that. it's a, yeah, and some of the videos, like I've got a couple of videos. One video I did an Elvis song. It's got seven million views. Seven million. Yeah, look at that right there. And, wow. And then you, I'm looking at yeah, it. And, and you look at where the people, what countries they are, or the the age group, uh, the uh, you know the the gender of the people that watch you, it's it's amazing. <laughs> There's Mozart. Mozart That's has funny. some problems. <laughs> wow, uh, incredible. I yeah, I did a classical record called Symphonica where I play all classical songs and then I dress as Mozart. I like that. I like Halloween. I like to wear the costume. When I put that wig on, I become someone else. Uh, it's crazy. Are you are you a, a horror film guy by chance? Yeah, I like all that stuff. I grew up in the soup, you know, uh, comic books, superheroes, yeah, yeah. scary, scary movies, Dawn of the Dead. Oh, any any George Romero movie, of course, and the remakes of the George Romero. I've seen all those, but there's this new movie called Terrifier Two that everyone is talking yeah, about, no. and it's really? the most. Rick just trying to get me to watch this thing. It's, it's like, the most he's disturbing, me about it, and it's like, yeah. You know, I'm like, are you telling me I'm going to watch stuff that I can't unsee? He goes, Yeah, I'm not. No, I'm out. No, I know. Terrifier no, I, two. Terrifier so two. You can get it on uh, Amazon's. It's called uh, Scarebox, and it's like another seven dollars a month on your Amazon subscription. But you can get all horror films, just all horror. You know, it's worth it. It's worth yeah. it. Yeah, totally. But um, I remember, man, I was just gonna say, yeah, no, I, I, I kind of want to do it, but I, I kind of am a, a sissy because it's supposed to be the most brutal, terrifying horror film of all time. I'm curious to see it. I remember when I was a kid, we snuck in to see The Exorcist. Wow. And after that we saw good. that, we were we were damaged. That movie scared the yeah. shit out of we were too young to see it, but because it's real. You know, it's it's kind of dealing with something yeah. that could be real, it you know. It could happen. That could yes. happen. Yes. Yeah. 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 So that well, the really thing is about like the Saw movies. The, for me, it's Saw, always yeah. been like the Saw movies and, and all those types of movies, psychological uh, horror movies. And I'm going, it's not the movie. It's that somebody actually had to think of that. That's the <laughs> one that's really like pretty you know, creepy. Yeah. I don't like it. Somebody I don't like it when thought I'm at of a these party. ways to torture people. Yeah, it's kind of scary. I don't like it when I'm at a party and some guy shows up with the Jason ma hockey mask on. <laughs> Actually, do you know that that face of Jason is actually the uh, death mask of Will Shatner from the Star Trek? Incredible. It does yeah. look like William Shatner. I mean, yeah. Captain Kirk. Yeah. Captain Kirk. That's correct, sir. That is correct. crazy. But yeah, I like all the scary movies. I like all that stuff, comic books. And I, I grew up on all that, that kind of garb. My father would garb. Why are you watching that garbage? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I like it. That's why. It's incredible. It's yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I like a good scary movie. I've seen a lot of them. The A's, the B's, and the C's. Yeah. I like the spoof on uh, Saw. I think when uh, Dr. Phil is trying to cut off his ankle, those movies are funny. They really are. They really are. Oh, it's a scary movie, too, or whatever the hell it is. <laughs> also, I like, well, what, yeah. what's the movie uh, What's the movie with uh, when the guys are, is it Hangover? Hangover 1, 2, and 3? Oh, yeah. I watch all three in a row. <laughs> That's a good day with a nice uh, bottle of Italian wine. <laughs> yeah. This is so crazy. I like the monkey. They're original. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Mike, yeah, they, they steal. They steal Mike Tyson's tiger. You got to take it back. It's great. It's great <laughs> hey, Mike, I am. I am yeah. just I, it, we're going to keep in touch, man. And I am going right. to uh, try to get my butt over there and enjoy some good Italian food with you, man. At some point, that'd be you incredible. Could, you come over here. Call me. I'll take you for a pizza. I love so it, guys. Vino, yeah, heck yeah. Tarana.com. Everyone check out Tarana.com. And of course, Mike Tarana on all the platforms, including TikTok. You could be the uh, instigator of his next viral video. But we man, really just enjoy this time together, man. 
Follow me. Follow me. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you. I don't know if the if your fan base enjoys it, but I I like talking about all. Oh heck yeah, man! People people from all walks of life love drummers because you know we are characters. The drummer's definitely the craziest guy in the band. I tell you what, <laughs> for sure. No, but you man, it's it's no there's there's uh there's no hiding the fact that you've had a career of over four decades because you are just a likable guy. In addition to the fact that you have mad skills, man. So congratulations. And Jim, thank you, buddy. It's so good to see you, man. I can't wait to spend some time with you in real life. Great questions. Great insights today. Uh, we're going to sign off, but Hey, this is episode 152. It's great to be back in the saddle. And if you guys are fans of the show, be sure to tell a friend, subscribe, share, rate, and review. It helps people find the show. And until next time, we'll see you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Bye, yeah. guys. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.